This is our story, the word of the Lord. Thanks, Paul. Would you open up your Bibles to 2 Timothy? 2 Timothy chapter 2, the passage that Paul just read to us. It's great to have a guy reading who's been to theological seminary. You can get those names right. (laughs) And practice. Phygelus, Hermogenes, Juanisophorus, great names. If, If you are expecting... You might want to consider those. So 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're beginning at verse 15. Come to Jesus. Come to Christian faith. And you, your life will be, from that point forward, perfect, easy, smooth sailing. No more hardships, no more difficulty, no more adversity, everything is just going to fall into place because you've become a Christian. It must be true, right? That's what I hear all the time from different uh, religions that present themselves as Christian. Well, you and I both know that um, sarcasm is one of the riskiest forms of rhetoric. That might sound good, It might sound nice, come to Jesus, come to faith in Christ, become a Christian and everything's going to be easy, a life of ease, no more struggle, no more difficulty with your husband, right? No more persecution from without. But the problem is it doesn't square with Christian life and experience. And bad theology is actually hurtful, it's harmful. Because if you believe that, if you buy into that, if that's your expectation, then as a Christian, when you're met with hardship and difficulty, which is inevitable, you're going to start asking these big questions like, what's going on? Where's God? Do I not have enough faith? Well, that type of thing that passes itself off as Christianity not only doesn't square with lived experience, it also doesn't make sense of the life of St. Paul. When we come to 2 Timothy, we're at the end of Paul's life. And look at chapter 1, verse 15. He's sitting in a prison cell, facing execution. Chapter 1, verse 15 also shows us, not only is he in prison facing execution, but he has now been abandoned by all of the churches that he gave his life to planting. It's all alone. It goes even further. The cruelest cut in this, I think, can be missed. It's chapter 1, verse 15, where it says that he's even been abandoned in his hour of greatest need by two of his dearest friends, by Jealous and Hermogenes. Paul, who has given his life to serving the Lord, finds himself in this moment of passive abandonment from all of his friends, but it even goes further. When you get to chapter 4, you're going to find out it's not only passive malevolence from his friends who are abandoning him, there's actually a guy in chapter 4, verse 14, named Alexander the coppersmith, who Paul says, man, that guy not only abandoned me, he set out to do me harm. He, he really tried to hurt Paul. And in chapter 4, verse 16, if you flipped over there, you'd see that Paul says, At my last defense, no one stood with me. I was all alone. So this whole come to Jesus, give your life to serving the Lord, and things will be grand. This whole idea of step into God's will and pursue God's will and you'll just be tiptoeing through the tulips with Tiny Tim is utter nonsense. Have a look at this quote from C.S. Lewis. Lewis said, I didn't go to religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of port would do that. He's an Anglican, right? Not a glass of port, a bottle of port. He says, if you want religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. The um, second most published book in human history is you know? The first is the Bible. The second is Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. 
Um, fantastic. Actually, if you want a copy, I'll give you one. I've, I've just purchased a whole bunch of them. They're excellent, and I'll give you a copy. But this is a, this is a point that's seen really clearly. It's an allegorical story of a guy named Christian who begins reading his Bible, and when he starts to read his Bible, he becomes aware of this massive burden on his shoulders. He was oblivious and just going about his life without any sense of burden or hardship until he started reading his Bible. But it was in reading his Bible that he discovered that he was living in the city of destruction and that God was calling him onto a path that would lead to the celestial city. Well, coming to Christian faith is much like Christian's experience. The first thing that you're aware of is your burden of sin and guilt before God. I was thinking about this in modern terms because you think, well, if, if coming to Christian faith makes me aware and realize a burden on my shoulders, why not just leave people in their ignorance? Well, I hope this isn't too graphic, but now that I'm over 40, I've started thinking a lot about my health. And I was thinking, you know, I think I'm going to go for a colonoscopy. <laughs> no, seriously, because I'd feel really stupid if I died of something that I could have prevented. And if you are imagining, you know, you, you go in for a colonoscopy and they discover that you have polyps, well, your first thing is, oh my gracious, right, the C word, I have small little forms of cancer. The burden is great, but aren't you better to know? Ignorance isn't bliss. When you first come to faith in Christ, there's a sense of burden because you become aware of your sin. So Christianity is not the path to a life of ease and, and only taking W's and never again getting an L. It's, it's a story of that includes hardship and suffering. But it's hardship and suffering with a purpose. Because, friends, whether you are a Christian or not, you're going to face suffering. But your Christian faith, you'll find, takes that suffering and gives it a purpose and a meaning. If you don't have a Christian religious faith, you're going to be faced with the same hardship and the same difficult and the same suffering. But you're going to do so staring over the edge of despair because you think, well, what good does it serve? What purpose does it have? And the answer without Christian faith is nothing. It's meaningless. But your Christian faith is going to give it meaning and purpose. It's also going to give you a different perspective because your Christian faith says, not only is there meaning and purpose in the present suffering, but it's a suffering that will ultimately lead to deliverance. It's a suffering that will ultimately lead to vindication. I... Um, think a lot about these things, you know, leading people to faith in Christ. And I look very closely at how Jesus did it. Jesus didn't walk up alongside people and say, hey, come follow me and your life is going to be awesome. I'm going to make sure there's like six figures in your bank account and you have a big investment portfolio and you're never going to have a spat and you're never going to have a hardship. You know, that isn't what he did. He came up alongside people and said, take up your cross and follow me. He said to people, if you put your hand to the plow and turn back, you're not even worthy of following me. He said things like, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Who wants to follow me? And then in his own life, when you look at Jesus, his perfect obedience to the Father led him to a cross. Well, no, that's actually not entirely true. His perfect obedience to the Father led him to an empty tomb and glory, but through a cross. You see what I'm saying? And you might think, well then, why would I come to Christian faith? And the answer is because it's the only remedy for the biggest problem in human existence. It's the only way to avoid heaven and go to he avoid hell and go to heaven. <laughs> right? I'm glad you caught that. <laughs> it means you're listening. 
like Christian in Pilgrim's Progress, the burden that comes with Christian faith is the realization that you're living in the city of destruction, but that there is a celestial city that God is calling you to. And and like Pilgrim's Progress, you'll find as you're walking through the Christian life, it's not a road of ease. In fact, it's a narrow road that leads to the celestial city. And along the way, taking up your cross and following Jesus is the thing that's going to give your life meaning and purpose and dignity. People who avoid that hardship and hold it at arm's length, they have no gravity to their life. They have no gravitas. They're just like cardboard cutouts along the way, right? Right? It's two-dimensional. You can tell when you talk to them. Along the way, embracing the suffering and the hardship and finding a way to trust in God through it, that's what gives your life meaning and purpose. It's a narrow road that leads to the celestial city. It's rocky and it's difficult. But the alternative is to take the easy path I just started reading Jonathan Haidt's new book, The Coddling of the American Mind. And in the introduction so far, Haidt has identified that we are living in the first generation that's coming to maturity of children who were helicopter parented. Okay? And this is not only not good for society and not only not good for culture, it's not good for the individuals themselves who are now growing into adulthood. These are kids who have had all responsibility taken away from them. Parents are trying to look after them. These are kids who are now in their 20s and 30s who were given participation medals and never spanked. Right? This is like this is a big problem. And the, and the problem, as Height sees it, is that this is creating a generation that are fragile and not resilient because they've avoided hardship their whole life. Their parents, in an effort to be good to them, have taken all of that suffering away from them and tried to shield them, but that's not the way life works. It's by engaging in the hardship and the suffering and the difficulty that you actually become stronger. Clinical psychiatrists and psychologists would tell you that if you have a phobia of something, the worst thing you can do is avoid that thing. You need to, in measured ways, engage it in safe environments, and you'll discover that it eventually loses its power. It's in suffering and hardship that your life comes to have meaning and purpose. It's counterintuitive. Well, so too is the Christian faith. If your Christian faith avoids suffering and avoids hardship, don't be surprised if you are not resilient, but if instead you're fragile. All right, let's dive into the text. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, So faced with these hardships that come, what should we do? Well, the first thing... Chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. Paul says that he's been abandoned by Phygelus and Hermogenes. Verse 16, he says, But may the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day, And you well know the service he rendered me at Ephesus. Here's the first way to deal with a difficult or hard situation in your Christian life. Friends. Good friends. For every fair weather friend that God gives you that will abandon you in your time of need, you'll find that God will give you a special friend who will sit with you in the darkest moments. I pray that whatever you are faced with today, that you have a want to suffer us. I know I've had had several of them. People who don't come alongside and just make light of your problem or try to be optimistic or, you know, well, it's going to be fine. Well, no, it's not. It sucks. It's terrible. But someone who, in the midst of your imprisonment, will refresh you and not be ashamed of your chains, someone who came to Rome, someone that's going to seek you out, someone that's going to render service to you, The first way to deal with suffering and hardship in the Christian life is to pray that God would give you a good friend. The second in chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says to Timothy, 
You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It's not only that in your suffering and in your hardship, God's going to provide you natural solutions. He has already provided you supernatural solutions in Jesus Christ. Okay, way too abstract. Let me try that again. John Stott says that if Paul had simply said to Timothy, Timothy, be strengthened, he might as well have told a snail to be fast. Timothy doesn't have the strength within him. He doesn't have the personal resource to overcome extreme hardship or suffering like when Paul's in prison. He just doesn't have it. But Paul takes it further. He doesn't say, hey, Timothy, just buck up, strengthen up, grab yourself by the bootstraps. You can do this. No, he says, access and marshal the resources that are yours in Christ. The Christian strength is a grace. It's a gift in Christ Jesus. John Owen, the 17th century Puritan, used to call it the exercise of given grace. God has given you as a Christian access to strength and power that you can't even imagine. And in the face of suffering and hardship, be strengthened in that. I think that's what Paul had in mind last week when we were looking at chapter 1, verse 7, and he said, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. The first remedy is friends. The second remedy in hardship is supernatural strength from God. The third remedy, chapter 2, verse 2, he says, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Friends, supernatural strength in the face of hardship and suffering. And the third one is to remember godly examples. Can you think of people in your life who are shining examples of their Christian faith in the face of hardship and difficulty. Well, if you go into my little study just across the hall here, you'll find that I have up a picture of David Maines, the founder of 100 Huntley Street. He was my good friend, died about a year and a half ago. And in times where I'm feeling weak, I just think back to his godly example and how he endured suffering in the Christian life. And there's something about that that encourages me and strengthens me. It's why I read missionary biographies. Because in their stories, I catch an example of what it means to serve God even in the face of hardship and suffering and difficulty. Paul tells Timothy, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Not only does God give us friends and supernatural strength, he also gives us mentors and people we can remember and look to. But it doesn't stop there. He says, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust that also to faithful men. The whole idea here is that the Christian person looks to others for encouragement, is strengthened by them, and then passes that strength and example on to others. The third source of strength is people that have modeled Christian faith in the face of their suffering. Finally, in this passage, Paul gives Timothy three pictures of what it looks like to be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. A soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. Do you see those in the text? They provide insight. First one, the soldier. Look at verses 3 to 4, chapter 2. Paul says, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled with civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Well, sometimes in the Christian world and in some of our hymns, we glorify this idea of being a Christian soldier. But that's not what Paul has in mind. Paul points to a soldier as an example of the Christian life, and he says, that's an example for you because soldiers know how to endure hardship. There's never a soldier who finds himself in battle and is like, zip, 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 like, wow, they're shooting at us. Like, this is crazy. No, no, they expect it because they know that they're in battle. And Paul says that's the, the picture of the Christian life. It's a war. 
You're like a soldier. Endure the hardship. Some of the hardships that you face as a Christian are hardships from without. You know, if you are going to live a gospel-shaped life, you are going to find yourself in a society that's hostile to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're going to find yourself in situations where people will not invite you to cocktail parties because you're a Christian. Or maybe the persecution will go even further than that. Maybe it's even within your family or within your workplace. You feel like you've been passed over for a promotion because of your Christian faith. Some of the hardships that we have to endure in our Christian life are from without. They're from other people. But this morning, I want to think especially about the hardships from within. Some of the internal struggles that you face in your Christian life. Because I think those are the heaviest burdens. The external ones are sometimes easy to dismiss because you think, well, that person is just being a jerk. But the internal hardships, the internal burdens are the heaviest, aren't they? Let me just take a stab at one of them. When you are invested in growing in your Christian life, when you are growing in holiness and in Christ-likeness, it's inevitable that you're going to come to a place where you begin to doubt whether you're even a Christian at all. In the process of growing in Christ, you're going to come to a place where you think, man, what if all of this is just a bunch of hogwash and I'm lying to myself? Or what if I'm just lying to others about who I am in Christ? I think it's paradoxical, but sometimes it's the result of a crisis. Sometimes something will happen in your life and it'll cause you to think, well, maybe I don't have enough faith or maybe it's because I, I don't know, did something wrong. But I actually think that coming to that place is a sign that you're growing growing closer and closer to God. Here's the paradox. When you are living far away from God, the sin in your life is something that you can just dissemble and cloak. The closer that you draw to a holy God, the more you are confronted with the depth and depravity of your own sin. Let me say it another way. The closer you draw to a holy God, the more you're confronted with the fact that you are not. And so the process of sanctification and growing in the Christian life will invariably lead you to a place where you think, man, maybe I'm just a sham. Maybe I'm not even a Christian. Maybe this sin in my life is evidence of the fact that I'm not even belonging to God. And that's a burden too great for anyone to bear. An internal hardship and difficulty. Well, talk about them all the time these days, but John Owen is really helpful in this. He says that the Christian person is a person in whom the dominion of sin has been canceled. Sin's status in your life has been radically changed. The sin that you see in your life is no longer in control or on the throne. Owen would say, you still see temptation, you still see even failure, but sin is no longer dominant in your life. John Owen says, if you want to know if you're still a Christian, if you belong to Christ, look at yourself and say, do I still glory in and rejoice in sin, or is it something that's distasteful to me? It's lost its dominion. It's lost its power. You still fall into it, you're still tempted by it, but the sin in your life no longer captures your imagination or your affections. I think there's something to that. Tempted, yes. Fail, yes. But when you do, you hate it. And you do everything in your power and in the power that is yours in Christ Jesus to wage war against it. That's part of what it is to endure internal hardship like a good soldier as a Christian. I think Owen in that is helpful but incomplete. If you are looking for assurance in your own Christian life and you only ever look within, you'll be led to despair. Look at verse 4. 
Paul says that the key to enduring hardship as a good soldier is to remember the one who enlisted you. True deep assurance in the Christian life is not found in looking within, but looking to God. Looking to the cross. You endure hardships not by looking to yourself, but by looking to Jesus. In other words, this quest for assurance, this particular hardship in the Christian life, this question, am I really a a Christian, is not solved by looking more deeply at yourself, but looking to God. And in those moments, even the weakest, most feeble, most faltering, doubting Christian is safe and secure in Christ. You can endure any hardship. Your rescue and your saving is not about you. Your rescue and your saving by God was in the heart and mind of God from before the ages began. That's what Paul told us last week. And Christ accomplished it on the cross and gave you a right standing before God. And so the remedy to struggles within and without for the Christian is not to just deny them or push them away or pretend that they don't exist, but instead to turn your face to Jesus. And when you do, you will see his strong hand and you will see his smiling countenance upon you. John Fawcett wrote these words in 1799. He said, check this out. So sing with joy, afflicted one. The battle's fierce, but the victory won. God shall supply all that you need. Yea, as your days, your strength shall be. So endure hardship as a good soldier. Scott and I were talking about this the other day, and the picture that Scott shared with me, I think it's brilliant. He said, imagine if you were a soldier who went to war knowing that the battle had already been won and knowing that in the face of that battle you were guaranteed to never die. And you were free then to wage that battle courageously and take risks and throw yourself out there because you know the battle has been won and you are safe and secure. Well, friends, that's the picture of the Christian life. You can endure hardships from within and from without knowing that the battle has already been won. So endure hardship as a good soldier. The second picture is the picture of the athlete who competes according to the rules. This is a reminder that whether it's in sports or in the Christian life, there are no shortcuts. You're not allowed to cut corners and cheat. You have to compete according to the rules. You have to run the race of life according to the gospel. Otherwise, you'll find yourself at the end and you may have finished the race, you may have even accumulated all kinds of accolades and all kinds of praise and all kinds of glory in this world, but if you do not compete according to the gospel, you're going to stand at the end and have nothing that will be stripped from you. When I was playing football in university, our strength training coach was a guy named Charlie Francis. You guys know that name? Anyone remember Charlie Francis? Charlie Francis is a name you might know because not only was he our strength training coach at university, but he was also the strength training coach for Ben Johnson. And I remember distinctly Charlie Francis standing up in front of our team at the, at the chalkboard. Back then we actually had chalkboards, not whiteboards, you know, slightly after the invention of the wheel. And um, Charlie Francis would tell us, he's like, you guys need to get strong and blah, blah, blah. And, and they would give us this big, thick manual of th- drugs that we couldn't take, and, um, and they would hand you the manual, and Charlie would hand it to us, and then he'd wink. Right? Well, how did that work out for Ben? Gold medal, crossed the finish line first, fastest man in the world, and at the end it was all stripped away because he didn't compete according to the rules. Uh, we were at the cottage a little while ago, and my nephew Jack was just little, and uh, we were down at the water, and he said to me, he's like, Uncle D, let's race up to the freezer and get some freezies. It's a hot summer day. I'm like, sure, let's go. So, you know, when you're racing with little kids, I gave him a good head start. 
let them go. Um, and then I just destroyed him. <laughs> I like ran as fast as I could and whew, blew by him like he was standing still. I got to the freezer. I'm like opening it already and pulling out the freezies by the time he shows up. And he's like, uh, he's like, yeah, I, I won. I'm like, you won? He's like, yeah, the race was to see who would come in second. <laughs> like, well, I don't think that's how it works, Jack. You gotta, you gotta compete according to the rules. And the rules of life are the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can go through your 80, 90 years on the planet competing according to your own rules, living according to your own righteousness. Everyone might tell you how wonderful you are and you might have a huge bank account and a cottage in the Muskokas. But if you don't compete according to God's rules, at the end it'll all turn to dust. If, however, you compete according to the rules of the game, 1 Peter chapter 5 says that you will be given an unfading crown of glory. So in the face of hardship, endure suffering like a soldier, compete like an athlete according to the rules, and then the third and final picture is that of a hardworking farmer. Again, it's not a glorified image of the Christian life, but Paul prizes the farmer as the picture of the Christian life for his hard work, for his hard work. No one wants to talk about hard work, but it's essential to living a life that is filled with meaning. If all you do is sit on the couch and watch Netflix, it feels good for an hour or so, but two or three days of it, you feel terrible. Hard work is what gives you that sense of accomplishment and where you can take a step back like God did on the seventh day and said, behold, it is good, right? Rest after hard work is what gives your life meaning and purpose. It's the struggle that gives you a sense of accomplishment. It's the difference between climbing a mountain and riding a gondola up the mountain. So if your life and your Christian faith are all about trying to find paths of ease and trying to find the shortcuts and not trying to work hard, at the end of it, it's going to feel meaningless and hopeless. This translates into our interpersonal relationships too. If in your marriage you've reached an impasse, so many people look at it at that moment and say, is it really worth the effort? Is it really worth the hardship? And people begin in their marriages to grow apart on disparate paths. And everything in your life, even good things, are seeking to drive you and your spouse apart. But when you are willing to roll up your sleeves and do the hard work necessary to turn back toward each other and grow, that relationship will flourish and blossom and grow. It's hard work that brings about a good result. And the same is true in the Christian life. Sometimes you don't feel like doing the hard work. Sometimes you think, couldn't this just be easy? But pressing in and doing the hard work of faith is where you shine. Paul says, think of the hardworking farmer. But the hardworking farmer is also a reminder of the gospel. Because farmers work as though it all depends on them, but trust knowing that it all depends on God. They put the seed in the ground, but God is the one who gives the increase. Paul finishes with this. Think it over, and the Lord will reveal it to you. You're faced with hardship and difficulty and struggling in your Christian life today. Maybe that's actually God's severe mercy to you. C.S. Lewis says in the screw tape letters that the slow, gentle road to hell is the most easy one to deceive people. No bumps, no sharp turns, it leads to destruction. Maybe if your life is marked by struggle and difficulty in the Christian faith, you're actually on the right path. Pray and ask God to show you. Let's pray together. Father, we repent of seeking lives of ease instead of seeking to bring glory to you. Lord, I pray for every person here this morning who is struggling 
facing hardship and difficulty. Lord, I pray that your strength would be made perfect in their weakness. That none of those moments of difficulty or hardship would be wasted, but that we would find that your grace is sufficient for us. And so we pray together, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let's stand together.